Hey friends, and welcome to another podcast episode. My name is Taylor Petrinovich, and I am joined today by my co-host, Kelly Gilster. Hey guys, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Taylor, what do you have going on this week? I am actually getting ready to fly down to Ohio Valley to capture Sean Thomas's, no, Sean Thomas Photography's um, workshop next week. He sent me a DM a few weeks ago asking if I would come along and shoot it for him for like promotional um, reasons. And yeah, I'm super, super excited. It's going to be a really cool editorial. He uh, put a lot of time and effort and money into it. So I'm excited for the content and to connect with some great photographers. Um, so yeah, how about you, Kelly? We actually just celebrated my daughter's first birthday last weekend. That was a huge endeavor. And yeah, I can't believe she's already won. And on top of that, we had like a huge rainstorm hit California. So for those of us listening in California, you know that there was like big buildup about this huge storm that was hitting over last weekend. So we basically crammed 60 people inside the house um, you know, to get away from the rain and we just went with it, went with the flow. Um, we did like some balloon installs over the kitchen island. We just made it work. I was up till like midnight getting everything. We rearranged the living room, all that stuff, but it was fun. Uh, I think though I'm ready for like birthday parties in a third party destination now, like away from mm. my house. So mm-hmm. my, my son's is coming up and I think we're just going to like go for Chuck E. Cheese, honestly. Oh my gosh. That's so funny that you say that because my daughter turns five next week and her birthday party is going to be at Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> it's awesome. How we call, funny. We call it the rat casino. <laughs> <laughs> It is such a rat casino. Oh my gosh. Um, they serve beer there now, so it's like a little more. Uh, yes, beer and wine. I mean, I think I need to hang out at Chuck E. Cheese more, honestly. Um, Let's go to the rat casino. But yeah. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to start calling it that. Um, all right, pulling it together, guys, bear with us. Um, We had Heather Hosh on the podcast, who is an incredible luxury wedding planner in Southern California. We have known Heather for over a decade. She's incredible. She knows her stuff. And it was really cool to hear her perspective on the booking process when it comes to filmmakers, just her experience on how a wedding planner can truly do the sales process for you. You know, in the lower tier markets, you're doing a lot of the sales on your own. You're pitching yourself, all that stuff. Planners really have a really great methodology on how they go about this, and it was really cool to listen to her, just her process. Yeah, I love it, and it was so great talking to Heather because um, Kelly and I can kind of tell you guys what we think about working with planners all day long, but I think there's so much power hearing it straight from a planner's mouth um, directly so that it kind of backs up what we've been trying to tell you guys, and she offers a lot of really great insight, so we can't wait to share her interview with you guys. This is the Level Up Podcast. I'm Taylor Petrinovich. And I'm Kelly Gilster of 618 Studios. And we are on a mission to help filmmakers level up their businesses and their craft so they can make more and work less. We want to help you confidently take your business from mainstream to luxury, and it all starts right here. Hi guys. So we have Heather Hosh with Heather Hosh Events joining us today. And Heather, I just love you so much because we've known each other for literally like our entire lengths of our businesses, I feel like. Like it's so been long. like like thir- you started also in 2010, right? I joined LVL at 2000 2010, but I've been doing this I'm going on 19 years. Heather has this really amazing story that before she was a wedding planner, were you a catering manager? I was a catering supervisor, manager, and coordinator. So I had all the jobs. And you like had a really great um, uniform. Oh, I wore a full tuxedo. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yep. Bow tie and everything. That's the best story. I don't I don't think I've heard that story enough. Um, every time it's better and better. Um, but today we have her on just to talk a little bit more on the role of wedding planner through the process and how us as wedding videographers can align our businesses to 
just be in unison with the planner. Um, as we're entering the luxury market, you will find yourself working with planners more and more. And so Heather is just going to kind of give us some insight into, you know, her roles as a planner. And then, like I said, how we can align our businesses with it. So um, Heather, tell us a little bit about where you're based, like where your business has taken you in 13 years, all that good stuff. Yeah. So I'm in Orange County, California. I have been in um, the wedding industry here for the majority of my career. I grew up a little bit north of LA and I started in a bridal salon. I worked there until I went to college. I got into catering. Catering led to weddings, wedding planning. And in a blink of an eye, I am a million years in, it feels like. Um, And I've definitely done the journey from starting weddings with, you know, no budgets up to ones that the budgets still seem to surprise me today. So excited to chat more about that kind of change because it can be a big one. Yeah. And I think too, there's, there's such a good thing, such a gift about experiencing all the different levels of the market, because I think that there's different things that you just learn along the way that you can still serve the luxury market so well because you were in that entry level market once you were in that mid-level market once. So there's, yeah, I feel like it's almost serves you better as a business owner to, like I said, experience all those different stages rather than just like finding that quick road to success or starting right off the bat, maybe assisting for like a luxury planner right away. Um, Would you agree? Completely agree. I think there's something to be said from working from the bottom. I think that you learn so much more about how to care for the client at the different stages and how to be a part of the team. And especially if you can tell that someone's not as used to that type of client and helping them. Yeah, that's so true. So Heather, to get things started, um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, someone who's listening, anyone who's listening, what are the main differences between what you would call maybe a day of planner slash month of planner, partial planning, and then full service planning? Yeah. So this is one of my favorite conversations because I think the industry unfortunately confuses those. We so often say day of coordinator or day of planner. And to me, coordination and planning are two very different things. Coordinators serve couples that have planned their own wedding and coordinators are coming in and making it happen. To me, planners are way more involved. They're they're a part of the planning from the beginning. They're usually heavily involved in design and they're, they and their team are executing it. So what the biggest difference is, is how involved they are in the process. So, so often people will say, oh, well, I haven't heard from you. I was talking to this client and you're like, well, I, they only hired me for coordination. So maybe that's month of, and they're only getting me for 30 days. Um, that's not something I offer anymore, but it's one of the most commonly offered services for coordinators across the country um, is month of, we tried to shift it from day of or week of, now it's called month of, and it's often just a 30 day service. Hmm. So then like, like you said, like all of a sudden a vendor is like, wait, I haven't heard from you. Now this, like this random person that's trying to get details from me, where's my client. So shifting focus now to um, like a planner now, at what point would they be entering the scene or when would a, a videographer like, like we're talking to right now, how can they expect to be conversing with the planner at that level? Usually if if it's a full service planner, they're talking to you from the very beginning. For example, I would speak to my client about what they're looking for in a filmmaker, what sort of coverage they want, and what sort of films they've seen that they've enjoyed. And then I'm going to get your package and pricing, your availability, and then pitch that to my client. Often in more of a partial planning, which is less common, um, but still something that many planners offer you may be talking more to the client and then they kind of hand it over to the planner midway. Um, That's the grayest area of wedding planning services. So unfortunately there's not a clear answer there, but then for coordination, you're very likely working with the client from start to finish. And the planner is, or the coordinator is really just coming in in that last 30 days of final details. So things like payment or um, double checking 
timing and timeline and locations and all of that, that's typically that final conversation happening in that 30 days. Hopefully that gets shifted to the coordinator, no longer to the client. Um, But when it's a planner, you are almost only talking to the planner and really making sure that they have filtered everything that the client wants to you and everything you need to communicate back to the client. In most of the cases, my clients are booking um, their video team really maybe off of a short 30 minute phone call and just to fine tune things. And then um, I suggest they also have like a 30 minute phone call in those final couple of weeks so that we can make sure that the things that they talked about six months ago are still accurate. They may have decided to include something they want to make sure the video team gets, or they just want to give more insight into maybe the cadence of the music, or they want it to be more upbeat or romantic. They want to be able to give that final insight. So when a videographer first cross paths with a planner for one of their clients, um, obviously that happens at initial inquiry. And then I'd assume that if the videographer or photographer is available, you then pitch them to your clients. Can we get a little bit of an insight on how that looks for you? Absolutely. So I I would say the disclaimer is we all do this differently, um, but happy to share what I typically do. Um, So to back up a tiny bit, I would say I typically in the getting to know conversation with my clients, we're talking very much about their wish list of things, what they want, what they like, what they don't like. Almost always within that conversation, they have told me they either value video very highly or they do not. And they also have probably shared with me if they want someone that is very active or very much in the background of things. Almost always it's because they have attended a wedding and they have experienced someone that didn't make them happy in that way. So I'm already trying to pair them only with people that are meeting the needs of the things that they noted to me. Secondary to that is then the budget allocation. So I build out a budget that is a big picture estimate broken down into each category for everything they've told me that they want. And then I'm creating that budget with a little bit of wiggle room here or there once we get going. And once you've given me your packages and your availability, I'm then pitching that to the client, typically in an email format. I often do three to four options and say, these are some of the best in the world. This is why I've pitched them to you, this person, link to website, link to Instagram. If you've given me any specific links to their venue, or any specific links to packages, I kind of put that below. And I'll also note, like, this is a husband-wife team. This is a local team. Like, these are the things that you should consider. And if I know for a fact working with you definitely checks one of the boxes of their concerns, um, then I'll be sure to highlight that. I also tell them, pour a drink, sit on the couch, put it up on your big screen, watch all these films. And then I try to guide them to the fact that The film is based on that couple. It likely has their music choices, their, um, you know, speeches, their, the things from their day that reflect them. So don't judge the video itself, judge the way it feels and the professionalism of it all. And typically if they watch a bunch of films for each person, they'll come back to me and say like, oh, this is our favorite. I feel like wedding films are so personal that even the ones that I think are great some of my clients won't and vice versa. So it usually has some sort of like visceral reaction. And then I have to go back to those three or four and three and say, thanks so much for your time. But unfortunately they went with a different direction. And I try to do that every time because I don't ever want someone holding a date for me. Hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah. I love hearing like the inner workings of your process. And I think it's really important for those listening or watching to understand that Like, you know, that's where the planners have everyone's best interest in mind. So like they are a friend of us all and they've been hired to um, basically pitch you to a couple. It's it's really different than when you're in more of that entry level or mid level. You're really used to pitching yourself in the luxury market. You've already kind of like established yourself and you have the relationship with that planner and they're actually doing the pitching and like the selling process for you. So it's very common to just really honestly send along your collections or if the planner has requested a custom proposal and then they will just, you know, take 
go from there. And then you'll hear, you know, if it's something that was a good fit or if they moved a different direction. Yeah. And what's so important to me, and I I think for most planners is finding the right fit. No one wants to serve a couple that isn't the right fit for them. That's not going to end well for anyone. So I think it's so important to have the website, your links, your videos, your your um, packages that are all geared towards that ideal client so that if that is the client that I'm sending everything to and pitching you, that they're going to feel the same way. Um, but yeah, there's a lot less direct sales tactics. So you do really want to make sure that the planner has everything they need to sell you. It's it's definitely different, but I will say I most of the time, the client's they trust me. That's why they've hired me. They hired me to be their buffer, to be their expert friend, to be their guide through this. So they trust that I'm sending them the best options. They're just trying to narrow it down, which one's the right fit. And I think that puts a lot less pressure on the cost of things, what's included. They're just trying to find their favorite. Yeah. And I think that was such a good point that you made that like, make sure that your portfolio, your website, the copy within your website, all of that stuff reflects your ideal client, because I think that is the biggest hook up, like hang up with, mm-hmm. um, with filmmakers is like, well, I need to get to know my client to make sure we're a good fit. And, you know, I think it's a really different perspective that the planner is the one that's vetting all of this. And, um, And they're the ones that's going to find that if you're a good fit for the couple. So like you said, you want it to be a good fit for everybody so that it all ends in success. Yeah. And I think too, if your work doesn't connect with the client, that's okay for this one. They're going to connect with someone else. But if you consistently are not getting picked from planners, there's probably an evaluation to do on what it is that you're giving to them. Very true. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, uh, Heather, can you kind of speak into like, what are some of the ranges that you see with your clients on what their common spend is for videography? So I'm happy to say I've seen it increase over the years. Um, I still don't think it competes with photo, which I find obnoxious because of the amount of time and effort and equipment that goes into it. And I try to educate the client, but, um, If it's someone who doesn't value video and I've pretty much had to twist their arm to even get it, we're in like the 65 to 85 range probably. Um, If it's someone that values, we're talking multiple days, multiple events, we're in the 18 to 20. So it's really such a huge range. And for me, that starts on, is it a priority for them? We have never enough money to spend. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars that will get allocated and it will get spent very quickly. So (laughs) I try to do photo and video out the gate to be sure that we are prioritizing that as best we can, but just some couples still don't quite get it. So the ones that do, I I'm seeing them spend around the 20 ballpark for wedding and then additional for events. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's like something that I've just, we've just become accustomed to is that the spend for videography tends to be about half of what they spend for photography. Um, I'm fine with it. I've realized like it is what it is. We have had like equal spend before Mm -hmm. and very rarely have we had more spend than for photography. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever seen more. I am seeing more like the top tier luxury clients. They're spending more equitable amounts for sure. Hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. Do you ever like have a client where they want to take the reins? Like what would happen if your client, like if say you didn't have a fit based on their budget and say they like, were like, oh, we only want to spend $1,500. What would be a conversation that you have with, with a client about that? That has happened over the years. Absolutely. And I have suggested that they still let me go to my resources and see if they have someone that's just learning or an assistant that would be willing to do it. Someone that I still feel like would be professional at the very least. I think it can be so scary to just have someone with the camera show up. And I try to educate that that could actually kind of ruin things, but you are investing in photography. They might get in the way. They might be really annoying to you and affect the way that you feel on your wedding day. So I try to educate the best I could. Honestly, this is probably not what you want to hear, but I think I would rather they don't get it than spend not enough on someone 
that at the very minimum is going to be professional. I actually like fully agree with you on that because (laughs) there's so at that level, like say they've invested like 15,000 in photography or more, like, you know, if they're having like a, um, you know, $500,000 wedding, like it could really be a problem to bring in a $1,500 videographer that just has never experienced that level of event before. Yeah. Yeah, And I think experience is so important. (laughs) Absolutely. And the good part about as long as they're spending, I mean, I I find at least in California, especially like over a hundred, $150,000, I can budget a fair cost for video in there. I really typically can get at minimum 65 in there, even if it's not a super, super high priority. Now, if they then start to upgrade, upgrade, add, add in other categories, that sometimes is where that is taken away. But if they're spending over two, they almost always value video. And I can usually allocate an appropriate budget line for that. So I do think that if you're listening to this and you're feeling like you aren't in an industry that's valued, you probably are just sitting in the wrong client category because the higher that these clients are spending, the more they definitely value it. And they really start to understand what they're going to get. And I always tell people, you are spending all this money. It goes by in an instant. I just got married and my only like takeaway was it just went too fast and you get your photos and you get your video. And so if you're the type of person, especially as a couple that is going to watch this over and over that wants full edits of speeches and ceremony and all those things like there, it's priceless. You should invest everything you need to, to make sure you have that in high quality. So you also want to be partnering with planners that are going to say that to their clients. I've heard planners say like, oh, photos, the most important video. Isn't that important? What? They're both super important, but video has something that photo never will. And that's movement and sound. When you lose your grandma who was sitting in the front row crying on your wedding day, you're going to want to look back and watch that. Yeah. I think even from, from my own wedding, like I have the photos of my grandparents who were alive at my wedding and attending. Um, but it it didn't really hit me. I felt like it really didn't hit me until Paul and I watched back like our full ceremony film and just like seeing them walk down the aisle. Like there's so much more life to it that it really just hit in a different way of like, Oh my gosh, like they were there, they were living, like it, Mm -hmm. it was a way different experience. So it's just something that, and, and Heather, I just have to say that, like, I really appreciate that you are a planner who sees value in video because I, I understand that that's not always the case. I think sometimes, um, not to like, I mean, I'm not going to like say this is a bad thing, but I think sometimes like planners can get really wrapped up in the design of things Mm -hmm. um, and the design can get carried away. And then there's no money left over for like other vendors, specifically video. Um, And I just think that's really a bummer, but um, it is. I think that's why it's so crucial to do to hire photo and video first before design has gotten out of control or you will run out of money because design is the easiest way for it to run crazy. But at the same time, as a planner, our job is to make sure our clients' best interests are met. And what they don't know is that the only thing they get are photo and video. They can't appreciate that until after. So it's our job to make sure they have the best possible photo and video for their budget, for their personality, for their needs. And I can't imagine, and I've seen this all too often, where planners are more focused on their own portfolio and their own photography portfolio, and they will allocate all the budget to design and photography. And then there is a subpar video or no video. And that's, we hear this all the time. That's couple's biggest regret is not hiring video because after you want to watch it, you want to relive it. Photos are amazing, but they don't quite capture it in the same way. Yeah, Yeah, totally agree. So going back to the, typically a photographer will cost about twice as much as a videographer. I actually just saw this in a Facebook group where a videographer was asking if this is the case. And there were a lot of comments that we're saying, yes, this, this is the case oftentimes. Um, but I kind of have like a hot take of, a, of an opinion. Um, I would much rather be like a lower paid vendor on like a really great wedding, like still being charged my rate. Like I didn't discount anything, um, but I'd rather that than be like the splurge, like the broke the budget 
thing, the most expensive thing, because it comes with such a different um, like pressure and dynamic. Um, so I don't know what you two think. Yeah. Kelly, yeah, I definitely. I... <laughs> <laughs> you go, Heather. What, what have been your experiences with this? I think just to kind of flip it into the video perspective, I would much rather have a video person that's the lowest paid vendor that's capturing an incredible day and then probably elevating their career rather than someone coming in that is the highest pay vendor and we didn't spend enough on design to really account for that. And so they're trying to make magic out of what exists. And I, I think that could be tricky. Um, as a planner, that's kind of really my worst nightmare. And that's unfortunately something that coordinators experience all the time. Coordinators so often are the lowest paid vendor. Sometimes DJs are paid higher than your month of coordinator. So think about how hard their job is and how wild that is on a day of to know that you were maybe the lowest paid. Yeah, we had an experience last year where it was very evident that we were the splurge vendor. And um, it was hard because I think, you know, the client experiences a certain level through your portfolio. They see like a certain level of work being portrayed. It's it's all the same technical things from a video perspective, Mm -hmm. but filming an arch that costs $1,200 versus an arch that costs $15,000 is very different. And your work looks very different. And so, um, I, we did get a little bit of feedback after delivering the video that like the bride wanted to see like wider shots and like bigger stuff. But in our minds, we were like, well, we were trying to like kind of hide like what was lacking in the surroundings of like trying to make it look more luxury. Um, And, and then, you know, that could have been luxury though for them. So just kind of like, you're constantly learning along the way too. And it is, it is really hard when you are the splurge vendor. I know that it can seem, you know, as a filmmaker, if you were the splurge vendor, it can seem like a huge honor. Um, But like Taylor said, it does come with a lot of pressure too. Um, I think even, not even the splurge vendor, but like a huge reach, like say the client had only budgeted like, 6,000, but you were 9,000 and they really stretched their budget to make it work. I think that that just comes with a certain level of expectation of like, well, we like went above our budget for you. So we expect this, 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 and this. So Mm -hmm. I found that it's much easier when the client is comfortable with your, you know, collections. And, um, I think that just like sets the, the intentions and everything in the right place. And honestly, there's probably a lot of room for better communication there. So if you know you're a splurge vendor, if you know that the client ended up spending way more on you than they had initially planned, a question that you probably really need to ask is what does success working together look like for you? Because maybe they're going to tell you we're having a budget wedding and we want to make it you look like make have you make it look like it wasn't or they're saying, we just want you to capture the way that you always capture. And we're so excited about how what beautiful our wedding is going to be. We mm-hmm. probably in that question can find out their intention. And I think if a couple doesn't tell us what their expectations are, it's really, really important to ask or we're going to miss the mark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Heather, like when you're working with a video team and you have your referrals in your back pocket that you are sending out to your client, can you share a little bit from your perspective, what are you looking for in a video team that is worthy of your referral? That's a good question. So unlike some planners that maybe only keep four to five in their pocket, I actually keep a list of over 20 something. Um, I want to make sure that it's budget, you know, appropriate, style appropriate, and comparable to their event. So whether sometimes the budget is in line with that, but not always. And I really try to only refer people I've worked with before. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> If you're watching on YouTube, you get to see Heather's cat. (laughs) (laughs) And me changing my exposure. Um, Cloudy day, it's okay. It is, yeah. (laughs) 
I think that it's difficult for me personally to refer someone I haven't worked with before. I sometimes will based on other vendor referrals from photographers or other planners or people I may have networked with. But ultimately, I like to know that person is a good person. They're going to be professional. They're going to take great care of my clients. Um, the work is actually kind of separate for me because ultimately the the couple is going to select whose work they like best. It doesn't really even matter if I like the work. I care more about the professionalism, the values as a human, and the way that they are going to work with myself, my couple, and the team. I can't put a stamp of approval on someone that's going to show up, be unprofessional, not dressed well, get in the way of the photographer, not be collaborative, take extra time if you can tell we're running late. Like there's so many ways to kind of put yourself on the bad side of a planner, but it's to me very easy to be on the good side. It's just do your job really well and love our clients and deliver a great video that they're going to love because they already love your work. So for me, I think you can make such an impact. The first chance you get to work with a planner make sure you're checking all those boxes. Show up on time. Make sure you read the freaking timeline, guys. Read the timeline. I can't tell you how many people either the week of or the day of ask me questions that are very clearly like at the top of the timeline. Please read it. I'm more than, I'm here to make sure that you have all the info you need, but don't make me repeat myself if I'm in the middle of setting up something. Um, and then also it's okay to check in and be like, how are we doing on time? I had this idea to go over here. Can I take five, 10 minutes? I'm going to give it to you if we have it, but if we don't have it, I'm not going to just say, yes, I may check in with the client and see if that's a priority. And those are things, those, that sort of communication and collaboration is so crucial to staying on a planner's good side and referrals horse, I think. Yeah, it's so true. Like we Taylor and I have always kind of said like at this level all of our work is good. It may be unique in different ways, but everyone's work is good. You've been in the industry for a certain amount of time, but you have to now transition back to client experience, the team working aspect. Like those are the small details that like really set aside, like set the, you know, set you apart from, you know, being able to climb that ladder up to, you know, the luxury market or the tiers within the luxury market. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's a planner you are seeking to work with, don't hesitate to consistently reach out to show them your most recent work. I don't do well when people ask for my time necessarily. It's almost always just a bad time when they ask, but I'm thrilled if you want to send me your most recent links, updated your website. Great change your packages, send that to me. I want to have all of that. So when I am doing the research, I have access and I don't have to ask you. I'll still make sure I have your current packages and pricing. I'll still check your availability, but don't hesitate to try to be top of mind. I think that's really important. Um, And I love it. Love, love, love. If I ask someone for their availability and they send me two or three links from that specific venue. My couples want to see, they want to imagine themselves getting married at their venue. So if you have that, that's such a good way to make sure that the the, the planner feels heard and seen by what you're asking and the couple way more likely are going to have a better idea of what their video will look like. Mm-hmm. It's so when, encouraging to hear from a planner that you like when vendors reach back out to stay top of mind with updated pricing, et cetera, because Kelly and I have actually been saying that on the podcast (laughs) and on Instagram. Um, But of course, like they can only take our word from it. So hearing it directly from a planner um, is so helpful to kind of confirm what we've been saying. So thank you for sharing that. I think it can feel salesy, but remember if you're switching from selling to couples and selling, selling to planners, we're just busy. Like everyone is busy, but planners are really juggling too many things at any given moment. And so if you're paying attention to my social media, interacting on that, so I'm seeing your name pop up and you're making sure I have all your current offerings and the things that you're excited about, I'm going to be way more likely to take a shot on you when maybe my go-tos are booked that date. Very true. I also learned a hot tip from Heather um, when we were were, like when we were sitting in on her academy um, and and it was basically that put your direct email in your inquiry form, have it somewhere on 
your website. And I remember sitting and I'm like, oh, I don't think my direct email is on my contact form. And you had such a good point. You're like, planners are busy. If we're reaching out to like six different videographers, we really don't want to fill out your contact form. We just want to like want to fill out a contact form. (laughs) Yes. So having just a direct email to where you can just be like, Hey, here's the date. Here's the venue. Are you available? Like you don't need to fill out everything else. Yeah. I think if you're really seeking the luxury client, you want to be working with planners, make your website easier for planners. You can even say, are you a planner? Email me directly, like encourage it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had to seek out or DM someone for their direct email. I'm probably going to get distracted and not make it to actually getting your information. Make it easy for me. I just want to know, are you available? I very often request custom packages because I know exactly what my client details are and what they're looking for. So you're not going to get that in a form. Also, this client, the client spending $200,000 to $500,000, they want their answers yesterday. They want to know who's available. They think they're behind. They are really so eager to lock in the best possible option because they know they're paying top dollar. So don't delay the process. Let me have your email. Let me send you exactly what it is that I need so that you can send it exactly back. The biggest waste of my time is someone not answering the questions that I just asked. I'm like, oh, you didn't give me the info I need to then pitch you. So say the client has already then received something else. I, well, I stopped sending it as I get it because I found that that wasn't necessarily fair. So I'll wait till I get all the info and then send the three or four options at once. But if the client is like, hey, where's that at? Where's that at? I will send it if needed as I get it. And so the person who's the most efficient may get the client because they just were easier for the planner to deal with. So make sure that your info is on there. Don't make me fill out a form, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're just going to do a little shameless plug for our planner communication email templates available at thelevelupco.com slash shop if you want to make that much quicker process. (laughs) Yeah, I even saw that we just had someone that had sent us a really sweet DM and was like, this is going to save me so much time. And you never know if like, because you were hemming and hawing over a reply to a planner, like that email might have already been sent off because they mm-hmm. got three or four people that has, have gotten back to them in the, you know, snap of a finger. So, um, yeah, I that's remember a great two, point. Yeah. Like Heather, you, I remember during on the Academy, you're like, I need my vendors to respond quickly. And, um, I knew that that was important, but I didn't really ever realize that you would be like left out of the conversation mm-hmm. or not making it to the next steps because maybe you weren't able to reply for a day or two. Um, Taylor, you were saying, are you I think ahead. a day or two, just to clarify, I think a day or two is okay. It's like four to five days. And if oh, it's wow. not over a weekend, I'm leaving you. Sorry, you're busy. You don't need the business right now. That's fine. But I've got to keep going with the options for this client. Yeah. I'm over here like breaking out in hives if I can't get back to a planner within a few hours. So um. <laughs> well, you two are maybe the most <laughs> quickly, you guys are great at quick communication. You have a quick, like efficient communication and you're quick to say, I can't. That's the other thing. There is nothing more annoying to me than someone waiting a week to reply only to tell me they weren't available. Oh my gosh. So I'm yeah. holding up that whole email to the client and they're, they're telling me no. Check your calendar Mm. real quick. Tell me no. Move on. I'll move on. It's great. Because like you said, I'm emailing probably six to eight people to get that list of three to four Mm -hmm. because I'm assuming that some people are unavailable. Yeah, that's so true. So- Heather, you've covered so many amazing things. I feel like we could talk to you for, we're going to have to have you on like another time too, to like, just, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but to kind of like paint a full picture here. What is it that you would tell a wedding filmmaker who is looking to enter into the luxury market? What are the, what are the first steps that they need to take? I think you definitely need to get comfortable talking, communicating, learning, asking questions from planners. Most of us are here to help you too. If you ask questions of what's the client's budget, what are they looking for? What can I best do to help you? I welcome all of that. I'm happy to be more collaborative in that education process to make sure we find the right fit for the client. Um, You need to know where luxury planners are 
where to find us, what sort of networks we're in. I highly recommend Engage. I can't say that enough in terms of watching filmmakers go from kind of budget to not. I think there's a lot of great resources and education specifically for filmmakers, but even more so learn from your friends, learn from the people that you admire, second shoot for them, get to know these luxury venues, how they take care of luxury clients. I think the biggest misstep I see is someone raising their prices, but their services, communication, and their their ability to work within that luxury team isn't there. So I think you need to learn and then raise your prices. I all too often, I think it's not raising your prices necessarily first. Um, and I'm sure you guys talk more about pricing and stuff, but try to be comparable. Like it's okay to ask the planner for the budget, because if you are sending me something that is so far under what the, like the other options are, this client will assume that you're not good. So if you send me packages and it's so far off, I very likely will tell you, I need a different package. I need you to be in range because that's what I think you're worth. Um, so in the same thing of, I may have a client that's just a little bit under of what you normally do. Don't be upset if I say, hey, would you mind doing this for a little bit less for this one? Then we'll get a chance to work together. And I promise I will try to send you the next one that's bigger. Like just be really, really honest and have open communication with planners um, because there's no straight line to this. It's not like a ladder that we all climb. It's the weirdest roller coaster and it changes every year. And, but planners are your friends, planners are your allies and go make as many friends, planner friends as you can. So, so good. good, Heather. So good. Um, talk to us a little bit about your Academy. Tell us, tell us more. Sure. So, um, like I said, I've been in the wedding industry a very long time, about 10 years ago, my business partner and I, Lindsay, we were receiving all these inquiries for girls most of the time, females wanting to be planners and saying, hey, how do we get into the industry? How do we get started? It's not like you go to school for being a wedding planner. Um, and back then there were really not very many education options. So we've created online resources, um, really a strong community to support each other. I think all too often planners are people that are sitting at home at their laptops and don't get enough community and support through that. And so we have in-person workshops, we have online virtual masterminds, and we have a lot of free resources and meetups so that we can support each other because being a planner is really hard. I feel so passionate about um, entrepreneurs, especially planners in the wedding industry, having a strong business, making sure they're making enough money, that they are profitable, and that their business is sustainable. And as many years as I've been doing this, I'm sure you feel the same. We see so many people come and go and I'm fine if people want to, you know, cycle out of the industry because they're just over it. But if they're doing it because they haven't made enough money, I think that there are ways to improve that. So um, Planner Life Academy is our way of giving back to the wedding industry. And I feel so lucky to be able to work with planners at all stages to make sure that they're really taking all the steps they need to have a sustainable business. Yeah. I think it's so amazing what you guys are doing. And I, I mean, I shared just a few little tidbits of knowledge that I learned sitting in on Academy and um, it's just really cool to be a fly on the wall and hearing the conversations that planners are having. Not all of it is geared directly towards, you know, filmmakers and all that, but it was so helpful. Paul and I would like come home each day and just like, be like, wow, that was mind blowing. Or like, that was so cool. I've never heard that before. Um, so I just think it's really cool what you're doing. And um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably figure out more ways to facilitate, facilitate conversations between planners and vendors. I think that's probably something that's missing and definitely one of my goals to kind of figure that out. You know, the kind of antiquated things like ABC and WIPA, I just don't think we're having the conversations we all want to be when we're in those rooms. So I definitely on my list is to figure out how to facilitate that a bit better. Cool. Well, thank you, Heather. This has been awesome. Thank you ladies for having me. I'm very excited about this podcast. I think what you're doing is great. And so many filmmakers 
need to hear these like this the the tips the resources but the nudge to keep going Thank you for joining us in this conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us reach more filmmakers just like you by taking a screenshot and sharing it on social media. Don't forget to tag us at The Level Up Co. And join us again next week, same time, same place, as we continue to level up the industry together.